And um, I'm proud to introduce our speaker for tonight, Dr. Kim Kierfit, who's Professor of Nuclear Engineering at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. And she's been there about seven months, which is about the same amount of time I've been here at Iowa State. And uh, prior to that appointment, she was Associate Professor of Nuclear Engineering at Georgia Institute of Technology. And prior to that, she was Associate Professor of Electrical Engineering at Arizona State University. And Kim has her, doc her doctorate from MIT in nuclear engineering, which is where I met her some years ago. I don't want to say how many years ago now. <laughs> and um, we're, we're very happy to have her here tonight to talk about mammography, technology, risks, and benefits. And Dan, do you want to say anything? <laughs> Dan yeah, Bolin. Uh, my name is Dan Bolin. questions. some of the information I'm going to try to share with you about mammography. I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on mammography and breast cancer. I'll then tell you about some of what, what, how we can image the breast and try to detect breast cancers early. And then I'll mention some of the work that's being done both legislatively as well as in research labs relating to try to improve this technology. We are involved in an epidemic in this country and around the world. And this is a women's epidemic, and it's called breast cancer, which is the leading cause of death in women under the age of 50. Its mortality rate is second only to arteriosclerosis in women, and we have uh, about 45,000 women dying in the United States of breast cancer each year. It's also the leading form of cancer. 
to, per to put things in perspective, the total amount of money spent on research relating to all forms of cancer is lower, was lower last year than the amount of money spent on AIDS research. So this should put into perspective breast cancer, which will affect one in 10 women sitting in this room and will affect everyone in this room because everyone in this room will know a woman who will have breast cancer, either as a friend, a relative, a wife, a mother. With early detect, with the, uh, in general, women who get breast cancer untreated, the 10 year survival rate is 25%. But the good news is, if breast cancer is detected early, the 10-year survival rate is 95%. So more than any other disease that is of epidemic proportions, there is a, something that can be done, and that is early detection of breast cancer. There is the greatest potential for saving lives through radiation that we have had, I think is, is mammography. And if it could be done without radiation, then we should definitely begin to do that. But at the moment, this is perhaps the one procedure in radiology that can save lives. Breast is very complicated in structure, and this is why it's so hard an image of the breast in order to search for cancers. Uh, in fact, it the breast itself consists of 15 to 20 overlapping nodes. It has several glands, milk producing glands in it, that all drain into one major excretory duct. However, the exact structure of the breast and the arrangement of these features in the breast is very different from woman to, to woman. There are also fibrous sheets within the breast tissue which give the breast its form and separate the lobes that are of a different structure. So the breast is not simple in that it has all these compartments of tissue supported by uh, ligaments in it. But here is a schematic of the uh, view of breast structure and you can see in the far most to the left that you have underneath the skin many excretor, many different ducts and sheaths and lobes which drain into the main uh, duct. You also um, have in the middle shown that there are different types of tissue. There's not only glandular tissue but fat or adipose tissue and if you blow up a portion of the middle on the right, you see that it is quite complicated in that you have different ligaments uh, holding the whole thing together. So what you have is a complicated pattern that is different in every woman that will tend to obscure seeing minute signs of breast cancer. In fact, the complexity posed by this problem from the viewpoint of a radiologist is it's an order of magnitude more difficult than attempting to see a broken bone or to detect lung cancer, to try to tell different types of lung diseases from each other. In fact, radiology has developed separate different types of film, and extra tubes in order to do mammography, and it completely pushes that technology to its limit. There are different, these different tissue types look differently on the mammogram, and a mammogram is simply an image of the breast. Uh, the fibrous and glandular tissue don't look much different from each other, and uh, they are therefore called fibroglandular tissue on an image of the breast. The fatty tissue or adipose tissue is much more radiolucent, it is uh, less dense, and that's what pro pro provides differences in darkness or contrast in the image when you look at an x-ray of the breast. 
the, uh, there is, as I mentioned earlier, an irregular structure of the connective tissues and the ducts, so that the breast looks like a mesh. And if you take something that's complicated in three dimensions and look at it in a two-dimensional picture, it becomes even more complicated and therefore makes the mammogram difficult to read. Things are further complicated by the fact that not only the shape, but the internal structure, the composition of breasts change dramatically with age. This is one of the reasons why mammography has different efficacies, as they say in medicine, it has different efficiencies or ability to succeed at finding uh, disease in younger and older women. In fact, uh, the mature breast has various uh, appear different appearances on uh, x-ray, but there's generally a balance between fibrogranular tissue and fatty tissue, but it's very, very hard in a mature breast to distinguish normal and abnormal tissues. In the postmenopausal breast, however, there's the same variation from woman to woman, but there's a greater amount of fat in the breast, which actually technically makes cancers easier to see in the breast. So mammography is more effective technically with the present state of the art in older women than in younger women. So there are technical reasons for that. Um, here I'm illustrating the changes in breast. If you just focus on the last two, uh, in the very white areas, which are right here, uh, that's the, the fat in the breast. And you can see there's a gr much greater portion of fat in general in the postmenopausal breast than in the mature breast. And it therefore presents a different imaging problem. There are different forms of breast cancer, and when we look at a mammogram, we are actually looking for the cancer in different ways, and different types of cancer will be obvious for different reasons, or, or any given cancer may show up on an x-ray for different reasons. The easiest thing would be you see the mass itself, you see the, the tumor there. That is rarely the way in which breast cancer is detected. Most of the time, a breast cancer will be, have associated with it um, calcifications or deposits of calcium. Because calcium is a very heavy element, it has a high atomic number if you're into chemistry, and it is very dense, it's like bone, it will show up very easily on an x-ray. So be, luckily, because most uh, a lot of breast cancers have calcifications associated with them. On the x-ray of the breast, what you actually see are these little dots, which correspond, which, which give the physician an idea that there's probably a cancer present. Another way of detecting cancer on a mammogram, this very complicated image, is through architectural distortions. That in fact, if you have a cancer in one of these compartments between the ligaments of breast tissue and it's growing and they push on the ligaments. And what will happen is that you then don't have this structure that is very flowing, but one of the ligaments will be pushed out of the way. And that will give a trained radiologist a clue that there may be something amiss in the breast. Uh, tissue density is another way. You can have dilation of the duct. You can also see skin and nipple changes. And sometimes by comparing radiographs of the left and right breast or comparing a radiograph taken several years ago with the present one, you can see differences or changes which can give additional clues. It, to look for the masses themselves, what a physician will be looking for will be the size. And the smaller size of uh, mass that is detected, the better the prognosis of the chances of being restored to health of the woman. Now, the problem is that with imaging, we try to design equipment so that we can see smaller and smaller things. This is called spatial 
resolution of the image of Christ. We, there has been tremendous improvement in the spatial resolution of the devices used to make nanograms in the last 10 years, which means that smaller and smaller um, sizes of masses can be detected. At the present time, however, um, we can only go so small, the order of several millimeters, just fractions of inches. So we have a technical limit. You may have already a tumor forming, but it is too small in structure and cannot be seen in this. It will not go detected until it is grown larger, which is why in women at risk, they may want to take mammograms more often because if you have a growing tumor, then eventually it will be large enough to see. Um, location, the most uh, common location is in the upper outer quadrant of the breast. So this is in this area of the breast. And so a physician will look most carefully in that part of the image. There are different shapes for masses, and masses that are round, oval, lobulated, or irregular in some way are more likely to be cancerous as opposed to benign. The margins or edges of an unusual mass sighted give also the physician clues as to uh, whether it is benign or a tumorous mass. Sharp uh, transitions are usually benign, but if you have rough edges, this will more, more likely be a cancer. So in an image of the breast, you would, the physician would like to be able to see not only a tiny, tiny object, but be able to see the edges in order to, to make some determination as to whether the, it is cancerous or not. <coughs> fat is highly radiolucent, and the presence of fat is very good and improves the radiograph, and that's not something technically under the control of uh, the mammographers. Fatty lesions, though, are dark and almost always benign, so how dark an image appears massacres is also clue as to whether something is cancerous or not. In general, because it is, there is a lot to be gained by detecting cancers early, usually if there is any question about a mammogram, then a biopsy should be done and to determine for sure. So mostly what we're looking at is that we want an image that will give us small objects, objects that may not be very dark or very high contrast, and this is actually a technical challenge. The calcifications or, or concentrations of calcium that accompany tumors are also very important to see on images. In uh, Most calcifications are very, very tiny. They're less than half, half a millimeter, so they're just a little smidgen. And where they are located within the breast gives a clue as to whether these are associated with tumor. For example, if they're close to the skin, they're most likely benign, whereas if they are uh, deep within the breast, it's more likely calcifications are associated with cancer. This is part of the reason with mammography that several views are taken. Because if you compress a three-dimensional object into a two-dimensional picture, you lose depth. But if you have two different views, you can determine how deep or where in three dimensions a calcification happens to be. The shape distribution and how radiopaic or how uh, much these calcifications absorb x-rays are also quite important. Architectural distortions are another thing that are looked for in a breast image. Because we're looking for so many different features in a complex image, it's difficult, say, to take the position out of the loop in any sort of way. I've had discussions with people in uh, computer science about trying to use some artificial intelligence means to look closer at images so that you don't have some position looking at an image and say, I don't see anything that maybe a computer could attempt to analyze this. The answer to that is that probably we can get to that point because it is possible to describe a complex 
although spatially varying in a local region, object with a texture, and then eventually we will have artificial intelligence means to help us also make sure that the tremendous human interaction with the image uh, is not flawed. That we'll have some backup, some computer will say, hey, buddy, Joe Bob, go look at this corner of the image again. But we do have a very complex situation where we must not only have excellent technology, but we must have quality control physicians reading these complicated, um, complicated images. I do want to go over some of the history of mammography because it went through a very bad and dark phase, which has left, uh, left people with what is currently a wrong impression about mammography in some senses. That early on in the mid-60s, the Surgeon General came along and said, well, mammography, the x-ray imaging of the breast in particular, may become very important. And a number of groups who had invested interest in uh, mammography, such as the American College of Radiology, which is that group of physicians who would be reading mammograms, the people who make the film and the equipment for x-ray mammography, as well as another group, the Cancer Control Division of the U.S. Public Health uh, Services, all got together and they agreed that uh, if we use special film and machines, the earliest images of the breast were done on regular x-ray machines, you know. Uh, Billy Boy would come in and throw his, his broken wrist on there and they'd image that, and then you'd have a woman come in and you'd image that, uh, image her breast, and it was the same type of equipment that was completely inadequate for doing the model. So basically you were giving radiation dose to the breast, and the breast is very radio sensitive. And so you were inducing cancers trying to find them. But with special film and machines in 1965, these groups, two of which had a vested interest in the technology, one of which, which presumably did not, said that mammography properly applied would help reduce the death rate. And we're not talking about just not feeling right, we're talking about dying. The death rate from breast cancer. And uh, it was also said that we should go and we should go all over the country and put these mammography machines in trailers and every woman in the United States should have her breast x-rays so that we can catch all of these cancers. But this was premature in a quality sense. In the 60s and 70s, it was attempted to get every woman to get breast cancer and uh, but at the same time, the health physicists were saying, wait a minute, the risk of cancer from mammography is that you get six cancers for every breast per rad scan, which was pretty darn high. So you'd end up getting, say, if you gave a tenth of a rad for a mammographic scan, that six women in ten would get breast cancer as a result of this procedure. So that if you went out and found one in 10, but induced six in 10, then this is not what we ought to be doing. And I think everyone sitting here would agree with me. And that was, for the most part, there was some truth to this, that the doses were very high. And not only that, the images that were being produced did not show objects as small as we can see today. They did not portray the differences between fatty and fibrogranular tissue, tissue that is the contrast as well as we do today. And they had very, very high dose rates. So in the 70s, mammography got a deserved bad name. And there was a scare foot, which was also fueled by the media, rightly or so or not. And um, so everyone was scared off from but what was happening during that time is there were development of new types of film and new X-ray tubes, which went right down to changing the targets in the tubes, operating them at lower energies, adding special filters with strange names like erbium, and going through all this stuff to tailor make the radiation tubes so that you would get maximum diagnostic interpretation 
prescription and lower the doses so that you're not causing cancer in your search to look for them. So as a consequence, the equipment underwent excellent improvements during the time that Lamarcky was getting a reserve of the last name. In the 70s and 80s, then, again, out would come these recommendations that women should be screened if they're in a high-risk group under 50, and all women over 50 should be, should be screened. And this did make sense, given the technological advances, but these technological advances were not effectively um, publicized to the women who were being arrested. And Would you define high-risk group? Can you tell us what a high-risk group might be? All right, let me see if I can pull that one out. Uh, it, it, I think it is, um, it is things like um, breast cancer on the mother's side of the family, sister who has breast cancer, there are all these types of things. There's a fair amount of research going on at the University of Michigan uh, who are charged by the genome project. And the genome project is mapping out the human genes, and their project is the breast cancer to find the, the breast cancer issue. Now, if the particularly high-risk women where they have two sisters or mother or grandmother are doing very radical things to have, to simply avoid breast cancer. <coughs> women are extremely high risk, uh, even when they have no breast cancer yet. And if we could find the marker for breast cancer, then you could go and have your blood sample made, and if you had the marker for breast cancer, then you could undergo the marker, and the rest of us could stay out of So there is stuff going on in terms of who is at risk. Um, certainly, if you're exposed uh, to, uh, to, to your, you somehow you're in an uh, occupational exposure incident, for example, if I were I would be concerned if I uh, was supposed to get a high amount of radiation as part of that job. I would not volunteer for that because that would also put me Environmental levels of radiation are, are not showing as a risk factor. Present situation is that 90% of all the cancers that are found were discovered by the mom. This is not to say that women should not do breast self-exam. Okay, breast self-exam, if you don't know how to do it, go on and how to do it. But 90% of all the, the, the cancers were found by mammography. And uh, I mentioned something about they're looking for a gene. That is highly uh, in the future. And there are many, many studies going on. And the newest American Cancer Society recommendations, and there was some flap over some Canadian data that then got retracted, but I think these now stand, which is 20 and over women should do breast self-examination every month. Age 35 to 39 should get at least one baseline mammal. They, they're pushing that age up a little bit, unless you have a family history of breast cancer. Age 40 to 49 uh, have mammography biannually, and 49 and up should have one annually. And the Clinton administration doesn't want to pay for it under 50. It's not possible. And following this through, this, I, I like the Clinton administration, but um, it is not, in my mind, cost effective to treat men with heart disease by the same argument. I mean, yeah, those old guys and they have heart disease, they're all, they don't take care of themselves. They, they're they under stress because they're causing us stress, so why should we treat them? I mean, if we're not going to pay for a mammography, then why should we treat men with heart disease? Because by the same argument, that's not cost effective. That's getting, I shouldn't do that. <laughs> There are several ways. I feel very, very strongly that breast cancer research is being underfunded in this country. And Dan should be particularly outraged because he has a wife, a mother, mother in law, daughters, right? So everyone should be outraged by this. 
There are several ways of imaging the breast, and just to make people aware that imaging scientists are trying to develop new means of detecting breast cancer. It's not like the x-ray equipment manufacturers have said, ha ha, we have a corner on the market. Because everyone is trying, and there are different ways of um, detecting breast cancer. I'll just show you a couple of them. Uh, one is called zero radiography. This is uh, making a Xerox picture of the breast with X-rays. And the way this works, believe it or not, and this was a way up until, until the last five years or so, a lot of times you went in for a mammography, you would get this Xerox picture of the breast. And it was a rather clever thing. thing is it's just like in a, in a Xerox machine, you have a plate, and they put a charge on the plate, and when the x-rays uh, that have gone through the breast hit the plate, they ionize and change the charge on the surface of the plate. And then a, um, uh, an ink is sprayed over the surface of the plate that goes to areas of different charge, and so where there's more or less charge, it's darker or brighter, and you basically end up something that looks like a Xerox. Now, zero radiography had several advantages. It was convenient to do. It was convenient because they didn't have to go and develop a film and mess around with all the chemicals. And things can go wrong with chemicals and developing film. You've got your pictures back from, from uh, you sent them away, you went to the drugstore, store, you pick them up, and they're all on our stoves or on our coats. Well, it's the same kinds of problems that need control. In mammography, you don't have that with zero radiography. And there's a significant edge enhancement feature with this because the ink tends to pile up right before uh, the charges go from positive and not negative. So if you were trying to look for the edge of a tumor, or the tumor was not much darker than the surrounding tissue, but its edge got right out somehow, you would have better detection of breast cancer. So that was one of the advantages of zero radiography. However, it was a lot higher radiation dose and did not see objects which were as small. It had lots of artifacts in it, and the energy of X-rays that it had to use were higher, which meant the rest of the body had more radiation dose. Yes, ma'am. And here is a uh, an abnormality uh, 
right there. Now, I have done uh, a fair amount of uh, consulting work, checking the performance of the monarchy units and consulting <coughs> the physicians as to whether they need to buy any equipment. And there are physicians who still use zero radiography, and I looked at their equipment, and I am an enemy of zero radiography because the dose is higher and the images aren't as good. But there are physicians who are used to looking at these because they read them for the last 20 years, and so they will continue to do that. You need to exercise some consumer smarts with regard to mammography. We see it, we're going to see less and less zero radiography. In fact, the country <coughs> and the museum no longer uses zero radiography, but they have switched to film screen mammography. Both techniques involve low energy x-rays. Film screen mammography has been helped by chemistry, better living through chemistry. We're hearing that a lot on the, on the commercials. Faster single emulsion films, they change the way in which uh, we set up and do uh, mammography. Compression is necessary, and I'm going to tell you why it's necessary. Is that technically, if you have an object which is uniformly flat, and you're imaging it with x the more uniformly flat it is, the more uniformly the scatter of the radiation is possible. The thinner you make it, the more you can see smaller and smaller objects because of scattering processes of the X-ray system pass through the tissue. So the more compression you can get, the better image you get. And it's not just sagamatic masochism on the part of uh, people who are doing mobility. <coughs> now, at, I used to work at some kind of cancer center, and I had a very troubling probably I guess, yes, I know, well, that's the thing. It doesn't say I'm But you, you can't, um, I would just share this with you, that I had a very painful breast condition. And I ignored it, ignored it, and I'm supposed to know about cancer writing. Well, the biggest problem you can have is ignoring something. That's when you're going to go from a 95 chance of survival to 75% chair of dying and get into denial over your medical condition. Why did I do that? Probably, it's like, I don't know, it's like I put, you know, put on my white coat that said doctor for good neurology, and I went over to the, the, the breast cancer people, some of the best breast cancer surgeons in the world, and because I was on staff, the research on staff, I got to be seen by this very famous breast cancer and he examined me and said, well, you don't have any problem when you have, you know, you have cysts in your ankle. And I said, well, this really is hurting me. And this guy who was treating women said, well, it's supposed to hurt your lung. He said, great, I don't have birth cancer. I just am supposed to go around hurting all the time. And so I said, well, is there anything at all that can be done? And he said, oh, there's some stupid theory about caffeine. And I was so wired living in Manhattan. I said, some stupid theory about caffeine. I could take us coffee in the morning. I couldn't do it. I don't have any more problems. But the important point here is that don't be in denial about this issue. And I talked with a woman psychologist who treated the, uh, who, who, was, who helped the women who had breast cancer and so on. She was sort of the psychologist for breast cancer. And she was my jogging partner. So we were going to kind of keep up with her because I had to tell her that she had to do something about this. Topic. So she tried to do whatever she did because that was very insensitive. There are women physicians who are specialized have a strong feeling about it, there's actually a love clinic in Boston. It's in all of the all of the different very experienced surgeons. And if you have strong feelings, you gotta shop around. I mean, if you don't like the person you're dealing with this this is life or death situation. You need to do some consumerism. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Sage and Cedar also 
also works on my sinus. Now, there is, however, proven that in sage, there is a chemical which is found to be anti-inflammatory. But sage is not proven to produce slight There's no, no, nothing proven about that. And you cannot fool around with breast cancer. Oh, I think I have breast cancer and I'm going to go in and be healthy. They have a 95% cure rate for breast cancer. So you need to give sort of the Western guys a chance on this. Not so, you know, say, you know, do the major head surgery and fix my sinus, so I'm going to try something else. And it's not life and death on that issue. Okay. Now, here's a typical mammogram of the breast. I believe that, uh, I don't know if this was a normal one or what, what this was. I can't tell, it's real complicated. And that's why you have highly trained radiologists. But not just any radiologist can read a mammogram. It used to be, okay, I do, you know, two mammogram cases every month. Well, today, with the new map the Modern Control Sanders Act of 1993, people who are reading your images, have to read a certain minimum number per week. And have to have specialized training in reading breast mammograms, in reading mammograms. This was not the case before this lovely legislation was passed in 1993. That anyone reading x-rays could read breast images. And this is a normal breast, okay? You know, who, who knows? The ultrasound has been used image the breast. Uh, ultrasound is not good for finding small masses or calcifications, but if you're known to have a mass from the from x-ray mammography, ultrasound might be done because you can easily tell sometimes uh, cysts from other masses. Uh, here's a typical uh, mammogram showing lots of, of uh, cysts and that these also show up on ultrasound. But ultrasound is practically useless as a screening device for breast cancer. Only sort of as a follow-up. You could also put heat sensitive plates or even take an infrared camera. This is an infrared image of a disease class. And it, you can see that, but this is a major disease breast and this would not yet work for detecting cancer early. There are also thermosensitive plates that can be wrapped around the breast to look at temperature differences. And once again, you can only see very large, uh, large masses, so it's not good for screening. The temperature differences due to the increased circulation. And also there are electrical changes to cancers, but we don't yet have a means of three-dimensional imaging of the tiny electrical currents in the body. We just are not that far. You could also diaphanoscopy. This is a hand right here holding a breast up to a light. Take a very bright light and hold the breast up to the light and stare at it, and you might be able to see an abnormality. Again, this will not work. Protecting small things. I mean, look at all the gray, you know, this is practically nothing in that. So, CT scanning and MRI have also uh, been used. But the only <coughs> method we presently have for detecting breast cancer early is X ray mammography. The doses are uh, 0.2 rad, average dose. Theoretically, that's a risk of 1 in 100,000 now the energies of interest of getting breast cancer. So your chance of getting breast cancer from a mammogram are one in a hundred thousand. Your chance of having breast cancer that needs detected is greater than one in ten. So you decide. There's a bottle, there's a 75% chance you'll die if you don't catch it early. There's only a 5% chance if you catch it early. You judge. This is this risk of one in a hundred thousand is equivalent to traveling 4,400 miles by air, 
660 miles by car, mountain climbing for 15 <coughs> minutes, or smoking eight cigarettes, which I think is really less than that because this risk is becoming higher and higher as we get more and more a day. Um, in fact, this is an old number, the 7%, I may be a World Health <coughs> Organization number. It, 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 your natural risk is 7%. If you do mammography like you're supposed to, it becomes 7.1%. There are many benefits to monography, many things. Are you going to talk any more about the MRI? No, because it, you cannot detect this tiny, uh, you cannot 